how do you actually disable someone with a sword? Hi folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiator. Now, some of you might be thinking, why is he holding an epee? Well, quite simply, I posted a, uh, uh, not a meme really, actually, it was a photo of uh, two fences, uh, epee fences, and one was stabbing the other one in the end of their toe. Now, for anyone who's done epee fencing, and yes, this is my uh, old electric epee that I used to do epee fencing with myself. Um, so anyone who's done epee will know that the toes or any part of the body are a valid target. And funnily enough, aiming for the tip of the opponent's toe, particularly after you've dealt uh, with, with an attack, uh, however how, and so they're, they're on the lunge, and then as they make the retreat, their body moves out of distance, their face moves out of distance, but their toe is usually left behind, and sometimes you can skewer the end of their toe on the way out. So it is an example of a, a tempo during which um, it might be safe to stab someone in the toe. And of course, in reality, using a real sword, uh, absolutely, you could stab someone in the toe. One little thing I'll mention on that is, of course, you've got to get through the shoe. And usually people are wearing shoes in real life. Um, and so your chances actually of giving them a grievous wound in the foot are fairly small. But the main point that comes up is that in HEMA, for example, in HEMA rules, we usually, not always, but we usually usually have something called the after blow. That is, I hit you, and there is a, a time during which, or a number of steps during which, you can try and hit me back. And the reason we have that is to try and avoid the issues that they get in epee fencing, whereby someone can go for, uh, you know, get that first touch in 25th of a second before the other one, for example, in the toe, before they again then get stabbed through the face. And remember that geometry, a toe is usually further away than a face. Um, but in epee fencing, if you get that first touch, you get the point but in HEMA fencing usually if I manage to go BAM yes and I get you in the toe and then you go smack straight through my face uh, immediately after well then that's clearly very bad in real life because yes you've got a toe wound and I've got a face wound generally speaking I'd rather have a toe wound than a face wound um, and so it's a way of kind of injecting a sense of reality into uh, HEMA fencing and um, we could debate that all day but what we're going to look at here is more what do you actually need to do with real swords to actually, by and large, incapacitate an opponent. But before we look into how to actually incapacitate an opponent with a real sword, and you could apply this to other weapons as well, first of all, we're gonna have a really super quick um, word from our sponsors who are Raid Shadow Legends. Raid is the hugely successful turn-based fantasy combat game. In fantasy genres, I've always been a massive fan of elves, and in Teleria, you've got two types of elves. Siroth, 700 years ago, tempted some of them away but over to the dark side and those have become the Dark Elves. The Dark Elves have got evil assassins and cunning warlocks and come on, who doesn't love a bad guy? In Raid, the Dark Elves also look really awesome. One of my favourite Dark Elf characters to use in the game is Foley. Just look at that cool armour. I'm also a big fan of Xavier because look at those really sweet arming swords she's got and she strangely reminds me of an ex. Now's a great time to get started in Raid and if you click my link in the description below or scan the QR code on screen, then you'll get unique bonuses worth $30. We're talking about a free epic champion, Rector Drath, 200k silver, one energy refill and one XP boost and one ancient shard so you can summon an awesome champion as soon as you get into game. These rewards are going to be waiting for you up here in the inbox and don't forget this is only for new players and only for the next 30 days. So let's get back to the main topic of this video. So how do you incapacitate someone with a sword? Now this might seem like a really simple question and lots of people who um, watch Game of Thrones and don't necessarily fence would say do you stick them with the pointy ends and yes indeed from a very simple point of view you're going to hit them with the sword. Okay, so the first thing is you have to successfully hit the other person with the sword. But additionally, you've got to remember, it's very easy to double, okay? That is to trade blows. And honestly, that is what a lot of beginners in um, any type of fencing or martial arts or um, reenactment, LARP, whatever, that is a huge percentage of what beginners end up doing. They end up doubling. And it has to be said, sometimes really experienced people can end up doubling a lot as well. I remember I fought once in the final of a, of a tournament against someone who's 
ranked very, very highly, and we both got loads of doubles because we were very evenly matched. Um, and, you know, in the pressure of the moment and the fact that there wasn't real life or death and it was uh, in the rules of the competition, we were desperate to try and get the first hit in because obviously you play to the rules if you're trying to win a game, essentially. Um, and it basically encouraged us to do loads of doubles and it was horrible. We both hated it. Anyway, um, it, that was a bad experience from, from that point of view. And actually, when I came to make rules for competitions later that actually stuck with me and I wanted to try and as much as possible because a lot of this is actually based on training rather than rules you want to train people to fight a certain way or not to fight a certain way uh, and with the rules you can kind of steer that and you can encourage it um, but they have to go in unison so anyway it kind of influenced me later on I thought okay you don't want to be training people or competing in a way that results in so many doubles just martially Absolutely, if you want to kill someone at any cost, kamikaze, just like a, in World War II, a kamikaze plane, if you accept that you will die and you, you just want to take out the opponent, absolutely charging them down and repeatedly shanking them or trying to get that one hit in through their chest before they thrust you through your chest is the best thing to do if you just want to take one person down however you're unlikely to survive that engagement and frankly you don't really need to train very much to do that you can get any any noob off the street you can give them five minutes of advice and they'll be able to be a kamikaze okay it's very difficult to fight against kamikazes good fencers can do it um, however not if it's a surprise attack not if they attack you from behind um, but nevertheless even face to face if it's a dual situation if someone's suicidal they're very difficult to deal with equally if they are uh, drunk or high on certain drugs or whatever maybe just furiously angry um, you know for all sorts of emotional reasons they they might be a very very difficult opponent to fight and uh, George Silver um, sort of you know points out things like this and there are numerous sources that point out that people in certain mental states or even physical con conditions think of the wounded tiger can be very difficult opponents to deal with okay so putting all of that accepting that's true and putting all of that aside how do you incapacitate a person um, without being wounded yourself? And I want to just point out that being wounded yourself might seem like a trade-off, but historically speaking, and when we're talking about swords, obviously, usually we're talking about historically, you don't really want to risk it for numerous reasons, okay? First of all, if an, an artery gets nicked, you might bleed out. So you might kill your opponent, you might bleed out. Um, if your hand gets disabled, for example, you might live, um, but uh, you might never be able to work again and you basically might die a pauper, okay? Um, so the, uh, you, you want to avoid injury, uh, uh, not to mention infection, of course, okay? You could get what might seem like a relatively minor wound, especially if it's a stab wound, though. Very difficult to deal with in the period, very likely to result in infection. We know this happened with gunshot wounds historically as well. Musket balls, pist uh, pistol balls, went into a person's body, in some cases went straight through or were extracted from the person's body, and the person still died of infection, sometimes only a week or two later, sometimes a year later. Um, so absolutely, infection's a problem, arterial blood loss is a problem, uh, uh, incapacity is a problem for your life in general. It might mean that you lose all your money and your um, rank status, everything, or someone else <laughs> finds it easy to assassinate you or whatever, you know, all sorts of reasons like that. So for numerous reasons, you don't get, want to get wounded. Even in a modern context, okay, if we were talking about swords or, or if we were talking about knives, for example, even if we we're talking about firearms in a modern context, you want to avoid being wounded Partly for some of the reasons I've just mentioned, although obviously modern medical science avoids a lot of those problems uh, and, you know, social kind of networks and, and uh, support networks and some things like this uh, deal with a lot of those issues. But there is one elephant in the room and that is you never really, and this is historical or modern, you never really know what a wound is going to do to you, okay? So something could seem superficial. If we go back to the stab in the foot, okay, the stab in the foot might be superficial or it might be completely disabling for the rest of your life, okay? Tendons might be severed, whatever. Equally, if you get stabbed, let's say in the thigh, okay, or cut in the thigh, that could be really minor. And you know, I've, I've had minor um, injuries. I dropped a rondel dagger in my own thigh once, 
pretty stupid thing to do, but there we go. Accidents happen. Uh, play with knives and <laughs> play stupid games and you win stupid prizes. Um, and I was lucky. It was it was a minor stab wound, nothing serious. Didn't I didn't even go to the hospital, actually. I just patched it up myself and it healed. It was fine. If that had landed in an artery, whole different story, okay? Um, equally, if something goes into your torso, um, usually we're talking about stab wounds here, but it could, in some situations, below the ribcage apply to cuts. It might hit an internal organ, it might not, and which internal organ matters as well, of course. Heart, very bad. Lungs, not great. Okay, so um, equally, a wound in the neck or throat, if it severs your windpipe or an artery, Bad news, but it might not. You might be fine. Same thing with the head, okay? Uh, obviously, brain injuries are bad. Um, eye injuries are bad. But lots of other wounds in the face and around the head might leave a nasty scar and not an awful lot more. So, wounds, it's like rolling a dice, okay? You might roll a 20 and be fine. You might roll a 1 and be completely screwed or dead, okay? Um, so that's the problem with getting hit. And that's also the problems when we're making rules for competitions and when we're simulating, uh, I think, which, which we should never really see HEMA fights or any other martial arts fights as simulating reality because each and every hit that's given, you never really know what it would do to someone. So, simple example, hit someone in the arm, okay? In the competition, hit someone in the arm. How do you score that? Well, you decide, oh, it's two points for a hit in the arm and it's three points for a hit in the head. That, those are completely arbitrary because a person can get hit in the head and be like, ah, oh, like blood everywhere, but still be fine, be, be completely fine. They can get hit in the arm. It might chop the arm off or it might just sever the tendons and oh, I can't hold my buckler anymore or my dagger if I'm doing rapier and dagger. I can't grapple anymore because I can't close my hand because the tendons have been severed. Or it could come up here, damn, oh, arterial blunder. Okay, I'm, I'm kind of okay, I'm fighting. I'm getting a bit faint. Everything's going a bit black. So you never really know, uh, you know, a hit in, just a simple thing like a hit in the arm or a hit in the head, you don't know what effect it's going to have. Right, so that's essentially a giant and slightly over-explained caveat. So in simple terms, with a sword, how do you incapacitate a person? Well, it depends partly on the type of sword, okay? Some swords are better at cutting, some swords are better at thrusting, some swords are a combination of both, but then if they are a combination of both, they usually are maybe not so good at penetrating with a thrust or they're not so good at giving a, a deep wound with a cut, something like this. So this sword, for example, is a compromise design, but it's really primarily a thrusting sword, okay? So dividing up cuts and thrusts. I'm not really gonna mention um, percussive blows, but I just want, well, I am gonna mention them, but I'm only gonna mention them in passing. Yes, indeed, if you come close, potentially smashing someone in the face or head, particularly with a pommel, or a guard might knock them out, okay? Generally speaking, those are gonna be things which wound, hurt a person, enable you to, uh, if, you, if you do come into a clinch and you smash someone in the forehead with the pommel, that is likely to daze them, confuse them. It may knock them out, but the finishing thing really would be that you then use the blade, okay? So yes, indeed, hilt strikes. Uh, there are some rare exceptions, I suppose, using the quill on with a, a mortschlag, um, with a longsword, for example, could indeed just kill someone straight outright, absolutely. Um, hence the name Mortschlag. Um, but generally speaking, with most types of swords, strikes with the hilt are gonna hurt, they're gonna injure, but they're not gonna kill or incapacitate a lot of the time, I think. You might disagree. Post below if you do. So cuts and thrusts. So cuts, generally speaking, interestingly, so my observation from reading hundreds, certainly dozens, uh, dozens or probably hundreds of historical sources from the ancient world, through the medieval period, through the Renaissance, lots and lots of sources from the Renaissance, particularly the 16th and 17th centuries, lots of dueling and battlefield stuff then. Then in, we get into the 18th and 19th century, again, a mixture of dueling, but especially battlefield stuff. There are loads of sources of personal combat that I have read, okay? So those, plus my sparring experience from HEMA and using swords, Sometimes seeing people being injured from blunt impact, but also generally having a fairly good idea of what sharp blades do to people as well. Both looking at crime reports, I used to work in a particular branch of the government where I had to look at a lot of uh, stab victim uh, reports and things like that. So my impressions, I'm gonna keep this as light touch and simple as possible, are with stabbing, okay, with thrusts, 
your best targets, uh, and in some ways this is a bit like shooting because the stab is a little bit like a bullet, torso, uh, particularly the upper torso uh, is uh, fatality, the lower torso is incapacitating, but that again, you never exactly know what a wounds, uh, what a, uh, what a weapon's going to do to a person when it actually hits them or enters them. So torso for, um, for thrusts, okay, so thrusts for torso, neck and throat for thrusts, face for thrusts. Now face is an interesting one because generally speaking a lot of thrusts would go into the face and be non-fatal but there's something as I'm sure you've been aware when you've ever been hit in the face by a hard or fast moving object it has a huge effect on the target so it has an effect that is out of proportion to the actual wound it causes. That being said the face is also quite delicate, okay? So uh, anything around the mouth that affects your ability to, to breathe, for example, or even talk. Um, obviously your nose, huge amounts of pain, and also you've got breathing there. Eyes, the ability to see. So wounds, thrusts to the face have a can potentially have a life-changing effect, but also have a very, very big psychological effect. And therefore I would put them in the incapacitation umbrella. Okay, so in terms of incapacitation, face kind of punches above its weight compared to the wound it gives. In terms of death dealing type incapacitation, torso thrusts. Now that's not to say that thrusts can't be effective on limbs as well. Indeed, thrusts through arms, absolutely. Now, I've been, um, <laughs> uh, shall we say, unfortunate enough to know of two thrusts with, um, with bladed things through people's arms. And in both of those cases, it did not incapacitate the person immediately. They carried on doing things for a few seconds afterwards, and they only stopped for psychological reasons. They stopped because they were like, oh shit, um, I've had a blade through my arm. Um, so it was interesting. The thrust didn't uh, didn't incapacitate the arm in those situations. In some situations it might, and I have to be honest, so I've had my uh, finger severely, well basically severed actually, it was uh, smashed with a blunt sword through gloves that weren't, <laughs> weren't adequate to what I was doing, and interestingly, um, so essentially my little finger was no longer joined to the bone, it was completely smashed up, um, and um, that was during a, a, an incorrect parry, so bam, I took the blow on my little finger. I was still holding the sword, and I could have still swung the sword, but my strength and agility using it would have been reduced by a certain percentage, say about 30%, okay? So it didn't incapacitate me, it did cause pain, but if it had been a life or death situation, I could have still fought on, okay? So um, wounds to the hand can go either way. They, I think they can either completely incapacitate you or you can keep fighting, okay? Thrusts, generally speaking, to hands, I think, my impression from everything I've read and everything I've seen and experienced myself is that thrusts tend to have less effect on hands than cuts do and bludgeoning blows. In fact, in some ways you could say bludgeoning blows are, are as effective as cuts on the hands because they smash fingers. So mechanically, you can't use the hand properly. Okay, so there we've got, um, I'll talk about bludgeoning blows at the end actually, because that's interesting. Um, so uh, thrusts, uh, and th uh, legs, okay, so thrust in, I've mentioned thrust in feet, thrust in uh, legs, particularly thighs, okay, thighs are big meaty targets, generally speaking, yes, a thrust could go through the shin, it's quite a long way down, it's going to hurt a lot, um, but uh, I think that the thigh th thrust is going to be more significant. In terms of fatality, obviously the artery in the thigh is the big target, you could argue that you're more likely to injure the artery statistically with a cut than a thrust because a thrust makes a small hole uh, that goes through, um, a cut it opens up a wider area so statistically I think you're more likely to hit the artery with a cut, also the angle that a cut might come in at is more likely to hit the artery than a thrust will do, I think on average. Um, but again your mi mileage might vary on that. So thrusts, a bit like gunshot wounds, Overall, if you want to incapacitate an opponent who's trying to kill you, if it's kill or be killed, or incapacitate or be incapacitated, um, then I would say, generally speaking, thrusts are best aimed at the torso, particularly upper torso, neck, and face as well, um, and don't underestimate how immediately debilitating a thrust in the throat would be. Okay, if you obviously it's a smaller target, but if you hit a thrust through the throat, I think most people are pretty much immediately going to stop uh, fighting 
because they won't be able to. Right, so uh, cuts. Now, cuts are an interesting thing. So cuts are almost in some way, I think of them as the opposite of thrusts, okay? So generally speaking, my impressions from reading all those sources and kind of my own life and reading modern crime reports and everything else is that cuts are most effective on the limbs, okay? And, uh, and the neck and the head, okay? So the neck and the head's vulnerable to everything, but the head's a bit different to thrust, and I'll talk about that in a second. So limbs. The reason being, and the main reason being, is that a cut lays across a certain, certain surface area. And the smaller the surface area, the more the energy that you've put into that blade is concentrated. So if you cut, for example, on a wrist or a thumb, if you like, that is concentrated on a small surface area. If you cut across the broad part of an arm up here, that's spread across a large surface area. Now, not only is it the simple equation of, of energy versus surface area that is being distributed across, but but you've also got the issue of, um, of clothing and assuming that anybody you're going to be hitting unless they're in a t-shirt is going to have some level of clothing on, you've also got more clothing material to get through. So generally speaking, cuts on the extremities of the arm are going to be the most wounding, but the upper arm can also be very effective. But this is in contrast to the torso. Now, this is not to say that cuts on the torso can't be effective. I think they can, and they're certainly mentioned in, in various martial arts. But my impression is the broad torso area, and also when you couple it with the type of clothing that tends to be looser, uh, more loosely suspended on your torso, whereas it tends to be tied to stretched across arms, this area is less like, it's more like to spread the load and you're less likely to cut through, basically. Shoulders are an interesting one. They're kind of halfway between the two. Shoulders are a big, more muscular, uh, and some senses squishy target than the arms tend to be, on most humans anyway. Um, but that being said, notice, that again, we come into the issue of clothing. Clothing tends to be quite stretched over shoulders, um, unless it's something which has obviously got built up shoulders on it, like a military jacket with epaulettes, for example. So if you've got epaulettes, that's actually going to be a pretty good protection. Uh, but generally speaking, shoulders are somewhere between the two. I say they're not as easy to cut or de uh, disable as something like a lower arm or a hand would be. And bear in mind, hands are often uh, naked. Uh, but uh, a shoulder is easier to wound probably than most torsos would be. Now legs are an interesting example. Generally speaking, a lot of people kind of poo-poo leg attacks for various reasons that I won't go into here because it warrants its own video at some point. But I will state this to you. Legs really hurt uh, when they're hit even with a blunt sword. They're comparatively easy to wound because they um, well, for, for reasons I'll come back to in a second, they're comparatively easy to wound. And additionally, they are your transportation device. Okay, so if you wound someone in the leg, it could have a very a, a disproportionately large effect on what you can do to them immediately afterwards. Okay, so in uh, sparring, you might often think about, oh, you know, I've got, a, I, I've got a nice thrust into their arm or I've got a good cut into their arm. But don't, don't underestimate the effect that a strong, even a tip cut across someone's thigh could have on their ability to fight after that. They might fall on the ground uh, from, from the wound. It might dis disable the leg. It could cut open an artery, all sorts of things. Or it might do nothing. But ease of wounding, what do I mean? Well, there's a few interesting things about this I've noticed over the years. I've noticed that leg cuts seem to hit people disproportionately hard compared to upper body cuts. Now, one of the reasons I believe for this is gravity, okay? And another reason is um, distance of movement. So, the sword is held at shoulder height, okay? So, generally speaking, we're fighting up here. When you strike at a leg, not only is the motion moving downwards assisted by gravity, so it's generally quite easy, it's easier to move the sword down than it is to move it up, but in addition to that, your sword is usually starting from a position of height. That means by the time you get down to the leg, you have built up loads of speed because the entire time that sword is accelerating down to the leg. So, leg hits, whilst they can be more risky, and I completely admit that, you have to set them up correctly, leg hits often hit very hard, um, and they hit on a target which, if wounded, can make a huge difference to that uh, your opponent's um, capabilities thereafter. 
But there's one other thing as well, which I often mention to my students and, and they notice in sparring, is that, you know, we wear jackets, we wear arm protectors, we wear all this stuff, and we do wear leg protectors, but the leg protection is usually a bit less protective. Now, if we look at a standard military soldier, for example, of the 17th, 18th, 19th century, they tend to have a jacket. They might even sometimes have something like a, a buff coat or a winter coat over the top. They've got a, sh a shako helmet or a, you know, any kind of big hat, whatever, kind of busby, any kind of hat on their head. They've got all of this stuff in their upper body. What have they got on their legs? Well, unless they're wearing a particularly long coat, they've basically just got one layer of fabric on their legs, haven't they? So whether it's medieval hose or whether it's, uh, you know, kind of Renaissance pantaloons, which are probably the most protective, actually, or whether it's a later, you know, 18th, 19th century soldier who's just got um, trousers, essentially, it's just one layer of fabric, maybe two layers of fabric. They have got very little on their legs. That means that that hit is more likely to cut through and is more likely to have an effect on the target. Now, heads with cuts are an interesting thing. So there is a general rule given in John Musgrave Weight, which tallies with all of my impressions as well. Generally speaking, tops of heads are actually not that easy to cut through. So he gives a piece of advice that cuts should be aimed at the level of the eyes or below, okay? Now, bearing in mind that unlike a thrust which comes down the middle, a cut tends to come from one side or the other, okay? So generally speaking, if you're aiming your cut up here, it still might, I mean, it might chop through someone's head, okay? It might take their scalp off. That does happen, and we know archaeologically that happened, certainly in the medieval period with broader blades than this. If you've got a good cutting sword, yes, indeed, you can just cleave through the top of someone's head. If you've got a narrower blade, like a 19th century sabre, then you're, or a rapier or something like that, then you're more advised to aim lower down on the head for a number of reasons that I have covered in previous videos. But in terms of wounding, because it's a softer target, even if you just look at the bone structures around here, the, or, the eye orbit around here and the jawbone and all of that stuff, you're more likely to do more damage down here than you are up here. Um, thanks to evolution. Equally the neck, okay? Any cuts that land on the sides of the necks here are gonna be very, very serious. And bear in mind, usually most soldiers in most periods have some of their face and some of their neck exposed. Uh, so very often in any kind of uniform, armor's a bit different, but in any kind of typical military uniform, this is also a more uncovered area as well. So with cuts, Generally speaking, I would say that lower parts of the arms, the hands, the wrists, the forearms, butt, elbows and upper arms are still a decent target as well. They're the most easy to wound. The legs are relatively easy to wound. The sides of the face and neck or head and neck are relatively easy to wound. So, um, right, blunt trauma, that's the final thing. So I hope this has been a relatively concise overview. Um, blunt trauma is an interesting thing. So bear in mind that in HEMA, we do regularly, two times a week in my club, some clubs are training six times a week, hit each other with real swords and we're wearing protective gear. And the only reason we don't get wounded, or at least not badly wounded, is because the swords are blunt, okay? So swords are not great bludgeoning weapons. If you want to bludgeon someone with blunt force, you use something like a war hammer or, um, or a pole ax or something like that. So quite simply, um, swords actually don't carry an awful lot of energy compared to a mace or a hammer or axe or something like that, okay? Because they're bottom heavy instead of top heavy. But there is a blunt trauma element to it. Now I mentioned fingers, um, and I would say if we take all the protective gear off that we wear in HEMA, obviously we wear fencing masks and stuff, but if you take off all of the gear that we wear, then actually blunt force, even if you don't cut, to certain areas is extremely painful and can be disabling, okay? Fingers are probably one of the easiest examples or clearest examples. So even if you don't cut through fingers, if you get a good strong blow with the narrow edge or even the flat of a sword, even quite a narrow sword, you can break fingers. If you break fingers, you can't use your weapons properly and you can't grapple properly and all sorts of other things, okay? So thumbs and fingers, bad news. Wrist, bad news. Most of the rest of the arm is generally fine against blunt impacts, except for the elbow. The elbow is very vulnerable as well. In terms of the legs, obviously the knees uh, and the shins, okay? Shins are disproportionately painful. For all of you out there who've whacked your shin on something at some point, a chair or a wall or anything like that, a bin, 
shins are painful yeah so even if you don't cut even if the person messes up their edge alignment a really strong whack around someone's shin is super painful um, and can distract someone certainly long enough you smack someone in the shin they go bam ah and then you can come around and hit them on the head or wherever okay so it can create openings knees shins particularly painful thighs are quite tough because they're big and muscly generally speaking funnily enough hip bone now this is mentioned in a number of uh, sources and um, blows that come in at hip height uh, about level with your butt but basically where your hip bone sticks out there can be extremely debilitating and in fact there are certain strikes which have been known to floor people uh, because of the almost the, the spasm effect of being hit in that joint very very nasty um, finally i would mention necks and heads okay so blunt trauma now this is where the top of the head comes in indeed top of the heads are not that easy to cleave with most kind of you know medium or narrow width swords um, even something like this uh, cavalry sword here however yes indeed if you're using something more like this austrian saber here with a whopping great blade like yes okay head top of heads no problem with that so it depends partly on what type of sword you're using but top of head with the rapier, it's not going to cut into the skull really, not, nothing significantly, not most types of rapier, it depends what you call a rapier, but that's, again, that's another topic. Um, so size of heads um, for cutting, fine, but blunt force, just the blunt force and momentum, even this quite narrow sword, if I, if I get a full swing, smack into the top of someone's head or the side of their head even more, or the side of their neck, just the blunt force, even if they've got high collar or, a hat, for example, with a brim that happens to be down and prevents the cut going through, leather, hat, cap, something like that, shako, uh, then indeed still the blunt force trauma can still be notable. I'm not saying that it will always be incapacitating, but it stands a chance of being. So I hope that's been a uh, relatively concise and clear overview. The general rule, if we wanted to boil this all down into a very, very quick summary, I'd say generally speaking, you're best advised with thrusts to aim at the torso, neck and face. With cuts, you're best advised to aim them at the sides of the head and neck, the lower parts of the arms and the legs. Thanks a lot for watching. Um, I hope this has been fun. See you back on the channel really soon. I'm Matt Easton. I will be next time as well. So I'll see you then. Cheers, folks.